time you hear the tree from the light. Then it comes to the body that you need. What does it mean Messiah matters? It means apart from him we can do nothing. It means he is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeshua is the only way of salvation. He is everything. We have to have the Tanakh to know the Messiah. But we have to have the Messiah to know the Tanakh. Without Messiah, we have nothing. Basically, it's all about the Messiah. It's Wednesday, August 1st, 2018. This is a special Messiah Matters number 228 waiting patiently by the phone for you to call in. My name is Caleb Hag, and with me, the man who literally taught me everything and also authored the commentary on the Johannine Epistles, my father, Tim Hag. How's it going, Dad? Hey, great. Glad to be here. Glad to be with you all. Good, good. Okay, so uh, it's a very special, special today. <laughs> it's a special, special. Um, uh, Rob is off uh, gallivanting in the Glacier National Park, and because of that, I decided this is a perfect opportunity to bring my father on. We have a lot to get to. Today is going to be one of, well, it's going to be our first call-in show, which is exciting. And uh, so before we get started, let's uh, let's first give you uh, information on that. You can call us 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. That's going to not go to a um, to a recording anymore. That's going to go to an operator, so if you have a question, you can call in, and um, we will start hopefully seeing people call in, and we will um, we will start taking calls here after we talk a little bit about my father's book. Before we do that, I want to also make sure that everybody knows uh, Messiah Matters is brought to you by Torah Resource, and obviously Torah Resource is, uh, well, it's my father's company. He started the company in 2001. And it has now grown to be a full-on school and publishing house and um, other things uh, beyond that ministry in general. My father and I are, are traveling uh, this coming Friday. We'll leave and go to Lucan, Ontario for a conference where my father and I are both speaking. My, uh, my dad will be presenting five lectures on the Holy Spirit. I was looking over his topics today, which I actually hadn't seen all of them like in a row until today, and it's going to be really a, a very good time. So we're excited for that and very appreciative to the people in Lucan, Ontario who are hosting us. So we hope to see, I know that a lot of people who are going to be listening today are going to be in Lucan, Ontario. So we're excited for that. And uh, Messiah Matters is also brought to you by our supporters. We couldn't uh, continue the show on unless it was for the support of our listeners. We're so thankful to everyone who supports us and especially thankful to our executive producers and our associate producers. Thank you very much for producing this show as well. Um, I already gave you the comment line. I'll give it to you one more time. 253-465-3205. Uh, I know I'm talking fast. And you can email us chag at torahresource.com. I'm going to hold this up to the uh, to the uh, uh, um, the camera here for a few seconds. This is the new book. This is our, we got proof copies in. They look excellent. We have ordered more and uh, you can pre-order this book. Um, it's 436 pages. It's quite an extensive work. Um, it's a beautiful book. And uh, there's also, what is it, 52 audio lectures that go along with it. We're going to get into this book here in just a few seconds. But first, before we do that, um, last week when Rob was with me, I said something that has brought on an onslaught of emails to me. And what I said was that the apostolic scriptures or the New Testament could make new new commands to us, right? And I gave the uh, I gave the the example of of for instance uh, a leader can only be a, a husband of one wife, and, and that maybe was probably not even the best example that I could have given. But um, there are others that we could give as well. And so uh, here's one of the many emails that I got. Uh, it said you use the example of Paul when he wrote that leaders should be the husband of one wife, 
Most would object to the idea of new commandments being added as they would quote Deuteronomy 4.2. And this is actually a verse that came up time and time again in the emails I was getting where it says, you shall not add to nor take away from the commandments. I was wondering if you can expand clar slash clarify on what you meant. I completely agree with you that the apostolic scriptures are just as much inspired as the Torah. Do new commandments get added then by the apostolic scriptures, or do they clarify the command the commandments already given? Is Paul giving us halakha, that's like uh, the way that we, we walk, based on the Torah commandments? And to be honest with you, this is a little bit of me opening my foot and putting uh, foot inside said mouth. Um, I think, and after talking to my father, I think a better way to say this is that the Torah expand, or the apostolic uh, scriptures expand on commands already given. What are your thoughts on this, Dad? Well, I think we would uh, refer to it as progressive revelation. In other words, the revelation that God gives us in the Torah, uh, in some cases, is in seed form. Of course, the most famous would be the Genesis 3.15 prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, that the seed of the woman would uh, uh, bruise the head or smash the head of the seed of the serpent. And so we don't know a whole lot about that just by reading uh, Genesis 3.15. But as we look for this promised one throughout the rest of the Torah, we get more and more information. And we do so in the prophets, of course, and ultimately in the writings. And then when we uh, come to the apostolic scriptures, we see the fruition of that. But even then, we hear from Yeshua himself a more full picture of his uh, mission, of who he is, and what he intends to accomplish, and what he will accomplish. So I guess I would say the best way to, to put it is that uh, no commands that are uh, unfolded in the progressive revelation of the scriptures are contradictory to what the foundation of the Torah has given. Uh, so, you know, I would I mean, in, in certain situations, there are certainly going to be new commands given. Yeshua himself gave commands. When he first sent the, um, the disciples out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, as he uh, said, he told them not to take any money, uh, not, you know, not to take gold or silver, but uh, to go to a house, and if the house received them, then they should stay. Uh, if the house didn't, then they should dust the... Uh, uh, dust the dust off their feet and and go to another but second the second time he sent them out like we see in Luke 22 he told them not only to take money but to take a sword well those were those were divine commands for uh, the beginning of this mission so it, those were not contradictory at all to the Torah but let's say that they they, uh, they expanded what the Torah had to say so what do we I mean maybe a um, uh, somebody might pose the objection that Paul gives us what seem to be new commands about a woman not uh, having something coming down from her head when she prays and or a man covering him, you know, not having something coming down from his head when he prays. Uh, these seem to be cultural issues, right? It, isn't this an, an adding to what would be otherwise the, the Torah commands? Well, yeah. Uh, for instance, if you take the Torah commandment to be in, in submission to those who have the rule over you, which was which would be a an expansion by way of the way we say it, but clearly uh, the Torah teaches submission to one's leaders, um, then you could say the same thing uh, for the commands that relate to uh, authority within the ecclesia, as Yeshua himself said. You know, we have another one, of course, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul uh, says, do not divorce, that if an unbelieving wife is willing to remain in the home, then don't divorce her. But if you look, you know, in, in Deuteronomy 24, it sounds like divorce is very wide. You know, if she's displeasing to her husband, then he can give her a writ of divorce and so forth. Of course, displeasing there, uh, if he finds some fault in her, I do see it with uh, the language there in the Hebrew would indicate that it's uh, some kind of infidelity or suspected infidelity. But at any rate, uh, Paul then then gives specific commands with regard to believers and unbelievers with regard to their marriages and so forth. So uh, again, it isn't that it um, is it brand new. Well, in some ways it is. In other words, he's he's clearly limiting. Um, 
He's, he's clearly limiting divorce that seems to be very broad in, De in Deuteronomy 24. But this isn't a new command, in other words, is your point, is that he's actually honing, he's honing the com command in, right? Right. I, I would say that there's one that comes to mind, I hadn't thought of it before, but the way that uh, Yeshua uh, talks about um, divorcing in, in Matthew 5.32 and in Matthew 19.9, particularly in Matthew 19.9, it says, if a man divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery. Now, if you think through that, um, if you think through that statement, and I've given it in kind of a paraphrase, but uh, if you think through that statement, couldn't someone simply say, no, if I marry another wife and even if I've divorced and I haven't divorced properly, so in God's eyes, my the wife that I've divorced is really still my wife. Okay, wouldn't that just be polygamy? In other words, yeah. Well, couldn't I have two wives, even if if I've sent one out of the house? If in God's eyes that's not a valid divorce, then in God's eyes we're still married. Yet I marry someone else. How would that be adultery? Wouldn't that just be, be polygamy? And we don't have anything in the Torah that specifically says that polygamy is adultery. But Yeshua seems to uh, strongly imply that in Matthew 19.9. Right. So there you have, I think, you have an, a narrowing and a specification of the commandments in a way that uh, were not given initially. Not not all of them, just some of them. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that that uh, helps some people uh, in, in their... Uh, and clarifies what I was trying to say. Um, you know, it seems as though... I, and, you know, going back, I, I'm remembering that, you know, exactly what I did say. I, I referenced Meredith Klein. Meredith Klein talks about how um, uh, you're not allowed to add or take away. Uh, and this is in reference to the covenant. Um, it's interesting. Uh, this argument actually is the argument I was trying to make is usually is, is one that's more made for uh, the books of the Bible after Deuteronomy. Some people say, oh, well, you can't add to the books of the Bible. No, he's talking about commandments within the actual land grant itself. Um, anyway, I, off topic even then. So I hope that clarifies and uh, helps people a little bit. Okay, let's move on to uh, our main topic here. And by the way, questions don't have to be about this. You can call and ask questions about just about anything um, that have to do with theology or the Bible. And I say theology or the Bible, because I'm sure that there are people who will, would like to ask other questions, but let's stick to theology and the Bible. Speaking of theology and the Bible, let's get to this. Uh, a commentary on the, the Johannine Epistles 1, 2, 3, John. Um, like I said, 400, I believe it's in 32 pages, this book is. Um let's just start with why did you decide to choose the Johannine epistles? Why not? I mean, it seems like in my mind, you know, you've done heavy hitters like Romans, you've done Galatians, you've done Hebrews, you've done Matthew. Um, this seems like an odd choice. Why not choose something like first Corinthians or something like, um, I don't know, something even like Mark, something like that. Why, why this? As I uh, was thinking ahead after we uh, finished our previous study in, in Hebrews, uh, well, first of all, all of these commentaries that I've the Lord has enabled me to write um, have been things that I was teaching on a weekly basis. And so, you know, our Wednesday night uh, uh, Bible study, which anyone and everyone is able to uh, uh, join us online if you'd like to. Uh, it's uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, uh, 7 o'clock Pacific time. We're in summer break right now. But at any rate, when we finished Hebrews, I thought, I began to think, well, at the be before we finished, I began to pray and, and think about and ask the Lord to lead me in what would be next. And I asked for some uh, suggestions from the listeners. But as I looked out over what we would call the Torah movement or whatever you want to call it, Hebrew roots or Messianic movement, I just began to see that there was something very similar to apparently what was going on in the first century uh, and to which John therefore addressed himself in these epistles. And that was what we might call, uh, well, what the scholars call nascent Gnosticism. Gnosticism, to be very brief, 
was a movement that came about uh, kind of growing out of the early uh, emerging Christianity uh, of the late first and, and then into the second centuries. Um, and it was, it was a, a mystical movement. It was a movement that says you have to have special knowledge. And once you get this special knowledge, then you have kind of a, um, a one-way ticket to truth. But you can't get this special knowledge just by reading a book or by uh, talking to someone. You have to have a spiritual experience. And uh, it's very akin to the extreme, I would call it the extreme charismatic movement that has showed up uh, in the neo-Pentecostal movement, where if you don't have this kind of special uh, anointing and this special experience, you really don't have the truth. The problem is that this led to all kinds of heresy. And the primary mm -hmm. heresy was this. The Gnostics came to the conclusion that if something has physicality, if someone, if something has substance, it is inherently evil, because they taught this strange doctrine that there were two gods, one who created the universe, who was an evil god, and then the true, the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was, who had no connection whatsoever with physical things, and you were trying to escape the physical world to emerge into this invisible world through experience, through mystical experience as well. Obviously, the big problem was Yeshua. Did Yeshua come in the flesh? Right. And um, the answer is, of course, yes. And so as I begin to think, how does that, how do, are we dealing with some of the same situations? And we are. We have people who are trying to tell us there are secret hidden meanings in the text. You can find them if you understand the meanings of various letters. You can find them if you count certain distances between letters. You can you can find them if you uh, do if you give each letter a number and then add up the numbers called gematria and you'll find hidden meanings. And you have all of these hidden meanings and you have these teachers going about making all kinds of uh, fantastic claims that people are just just bowled over with like nobody ever told me this before well it reminds me a lot of gnosticism and mm -hmm. so you know john in his epistles addresses this and he starts right out by saying the one whom our hands have handled our eyes have seen i'm paraphrasing actually but if if you if you just read if you read the text he says um at, at the very beginning of first john he says what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands. So what is he doing there? He is combating those who are saying, no, 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 the physical world, we don't want any part of that. We're going to realm, go into this realm of mystical kinds of understanding. And he says, no, it's all invested in a man who came, who was sent by God and became man. And this one is none other than the eternal one who has come to dwell with us. So... And then, and I don't want to take too much just by your first question, but what he does then is he he begins to um, he begins to show how false teaching and false teachers are a mark of the anti Messiah. And so we have a lot. Uh, he he spends quite a bit of time talking about the anti Messiah, and that we have to be on guard against the anti Messiah. And so uh, that also is something that is pertaining to the current movement uh, of the Messianic movement, uh, Torah movement, and that is that we find people who are kind of hedging upon whether Yeshua is truly divine. You know, we see a diminution of the importance of Yeshua. And guess what? Yeshua matters. Mm. Okay, so I want to go now. If you have a question, or a biblical question, or a theological question you'd like to ask, my father, Tim Hegg, you can call us 253-465-3205. Nisa in the chat room is in Canada, so she can't call in. She said, I know uh, Mr. Hegg wears a kippa, and I've always been curious his stance on that and why. That's a good question. Well, obviously, uh, contrary to some of the things that I've read in the past, um, Yeshua did not wear a kippa. Now, whether he wore a, a hat or not, it may well be. 
Uh, some have pointed to the 1 Corinthians 11 passage where Paul says that a man should not have something coming down from his head. But Paul is talking about hair in that passage, as is made clear if you read the whole context. So, in Especially the, in, in the Greek. Yeah, in the Greek. Well, in the, in the, in the Greco-Roman world, a man who had long hair was, was pointed out as a homosexual. And you can see all of the Greek statuary and so forth. They all have short cropped hair. Um, and, and Paul even says uh, there in 1 Corinthians 11, does not even nature tell you that it's wrong for a man to have long hair? If you just think of nature, you think, no, if a man just naturally lets his hair grow, it gets long. But the Greek word there is phusis, and it can just as well be understood as culture. Does not culture even tell you that it's, un, that it's wrong for a man to have long hair? But, uh, okay, so... Um, did Yeshua wear something on his head, head cover, you know, a hat or some, it may well have been. What, um, the kippah is late. It's middle ages at the earliest and later. Um, but in our culture, it is a sign of, uh, of, of a Jewish connection. And so I want to, uh, I want to connect with that. I want to do it publicly. And so I can say I have had many, many opportunities in the past 30 years, or however long since I started wearing a kippah, um, I've had many, many opportunities to talk to people about Yeshua because I was wearing a kippah. And so when I'm out in public, if I'm at the store, if at the post office, there will be people who come and say, oh, you're, you're Jewish. And I can honestly say, yes, I am Jewish. Uh, but and then I get a chance to talk with them. And, you know, they're surprised. And I, the one thing that I regularly want to do right up front if the opportunity presents itself, because most people think Jewish people uh, don't believe in Jesus, they would say. And I say, yes, I'm Jewish, and I be but I believe that Yeshua, or you might call him Jesus, is truly our Messiah, and he has come, and uh, I'm happy to talk to you about him. And so it opens a lot of doors. So in short, I'm identifying with, with the Jewish people. Some would say I'm identifying with religious Jewish people. Okay, whatever. Uh, but I'm identifying with them and willing then to be a testimony to them and to others uh, of, the, of the Messiah Yeshua. Um, we have another person from Canada in the chat room who is asking a question. Um, uh, Peter's vision notes the Gentiles can come into covenant met with great rejoicing, but why? Couldn't Gentiles always come into the covenant before Messiah? Yes, from God's standpoint, standpoint or point of view is absolutely true. And we find this simply because uh, Numbers 15, for instance, tells us that there should be one one Torah for the native born and for the uh, the ger, the, the sojourner, the one who is coming in to reside in Israel. And we find the same thing in Isaiah 56 and 58 in view of a coming millennial uh, picture that uh, even the nokri, even the, the foreigner who was previously known as an idolater, but comes and joins himself to the Lord is the phrase that Isaiah uses, then uh, he will be welcomed in the temple and uh, so forth and so on. Okay, well, um, in the time of Yeshua, however, it, it seems quite clear that the, the major religious Jewish community were not happy having Gentiles come in. Uh, they were seen as second-class citizens in the Jewish community uh, if they were coming in to give money and so forth, they were allowed in. But um, they wanted them to go through a man-made ceremony. And that man-made ceremony of conversion was something that the scriptures don't speak to and something, frankly, that the apostles were against. They were against it because they wanted uh, to see, and rightly so, the promise made to Abraham fulfilled, that in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. If everyone, if every male coming in is given so-called uh, legal Jewish status through some man-made ceremony of conversion, then you still have only one people being blessed. And uh, no, they wanted a people from every nation. So when they, when the, when the Gentile believers were, were made to know that you do not have, you cannot convert to become a Jew. You are who you are, and God intended that you would be a non-Jew, and that you, together with the Jewish persons, would fulfill the promise made to Abraham. And that is the goal of 
the gospel. For in Galatians 3 8, if I, yes, Galatians 3 8, he, uh, Paul says the gospel was preached to Abraham when it was said, in your seed, in your descendant, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So this is why the, uh, the, the Gentiles rejoiced that that promise was now being fulfilled and they were helping or being, you know, the, the, the fruit of that fulfillment. Okay. It looks like we have our first call. Um, give me just a second here. <laughs> our screener picked him back up. Hang on. Okay, while we wait, um, I'm going to give the phone number one more time for anybody who has questions. It looks like we have just a ton of um, good conversation going on in the chat room, which is awesome. Um, and 253-465-3205. 253-465-3205. Okay, while I wait for uh, our screener to put him back into uh, into uh, our park. Uh, so let's go to one of my questions then, Dad. Uh, you, so you wrote on um, the Jonine epistles. It seems to me that, that John has written all three of these epistles. And I'm assuming that this is the same John who wrote the gospel, Right. So yeah. the question is, do we see continuity between not only the gospel, but then all three of the epistles? Yes, we do. And uh, in the commentary at, in the beginning um, of, uh, in the introduction to first, to the, uh, first John, as well as into the introduction to second and third John, um, actually on pages uh, four and five of the commentary, I note exact parallels between 1 John and the Gospel of John, in fact, even some verbatim uh, similarities. There are similarities in style, there are similarities in, um, in verbiage, in the, the words that are used, and there's uh, uh, good parallels in terms of themes. In fact, there are at least a couple of times in 1 John where it appears quite likely that John presumes his audience has read the Gospel. And so that's a question of whether the epistles precede the gospel or follow it. And almost all scholars would say that the epistles are written after the gospel has been written and the gospel has circulated to a certain extent. Now, we don't have a good time of dating the epistles, or, uh, but we know that they're late. Uh, they're later just by some of the things that are mentioned. And uh, same with the gospel of John. Now, there are some scholars who put the gospel of John quite earlier. Um, even as early as 60s, in the 60s. But most would put the Gospel of John after the destruction of the temple. And we, we have to assume that the Gospel of John comes after the other Gospels because he assumes in the Gospel of John that his readers have heard, have at least listened to or read themselves the, the, the first Gospels. Right, exactly. And so, uh, yes, it, it, it seems uh, to me absolutely convincing that the author of the Gospel of John is indeed the author of the epistles. Um, and it's very nice because sometimes in the epistles he will make a statement which is semi-abbreviated, but he uses the same verbiage, the same words that he used in the Gospel. So if you go back and read that part of the Gospel, it fills the whole picture out. And I've tried to do that in the commentary whenever necessary to point it back to the gospel and, and help to explain in further detail what he is driving at in the epistles. Okay, so we're talking about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And Liam in the chat room says, who says there has to be 66 inspired books? Rome? There are many more ancient inspired texts out there. We know nothing. Is there a reason why you believe that there are only 66 books in the Bible? Yes, um... Well, I could get into a philosophical issue here, uh, but I'll just say it, and maybe it will raise uh, more questions than answers, I'm not sure. But uh, my understanding of epistemology, which is just a big philosophical word for how we know that we know, how we, are, how we can have certainty, uh, if we have certainty about anything, it's because we have started with a premise, the, uh, the likes of which we cannot empirically prove. So I start with the premise that God is and that he has truthfully revealed himself. Mm. And yes. then in the revelation that he has given us, he has told us that he intends us to live in accordance with what he has revealed. This tells me that he would there preserve what he has written. 
and the preservation of the 66 books is verified if you say by Rome no uh, by the time you come to the second and third centuries you have uh, early church fathers this is before Rome became a center of, of the Roman Catholic Church for instance but you have early church fathers uh, quoting now do they quote non canonical text yes they do but I believe that the I take the view that the scriptures are self authenticating mm -hmm. and that means that when we find for instance the Maccabees we find uh, egregious historical errors in in those uh, books we find some of the same in other apocryphal books we find um, just uh, not not only um, historical error we find geographical errors and so forth and so on now some would say well we find the same thing in the bible but my uh my challenge has been if we compare scripture with scripture do we find scripture authenticating itself and the answer is yes mm -hmm. so i believe that in god's good providence that he maintained the scriptures that he intends us to follow and he did that through the means of human agency even as he used human agency for the writing of the scriptures so the the fact that uh, that the scriptures themselves tell us that that holy men of old were born along by the holy spirit peter mm -hmm. tells us mm -hmm. and so the, the in this way the scriptures themselves have a self-authenticating reality that is they bear the mark of um of inspiration and how do they bear that how is that seen how is that known it's known because of a wide circle of agreement amongst many witnesses who study and who read and who agree. And that's what happened in the first four centuries. And people, and people, be, people, people willing to be, uh, uh, to, to be uh, persecuted. Perse yes, willing to be persecuted for, the, uh, for, for what the, the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't find such uh, willingness to be persecuted. Now, I know there are stories about those being willing to be persecuted in, uh, in, in the Maccabees and so forth, but we find that ultimately the scriptures stood a test of time that apocryphal literature and, and other literature did not. Okay, let's go back to your book, the commentary on the Johannine epistles. Actually, hang on, let's go first to a call, and let's see here, who, who do we have? It looks like we have, I have a reverb or an echo. Hang on just a second. Um, let me see if I can take this off. Is it, did that work? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna keep going. I will try not to uh, say too much until. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let's go to our call. It looks like we have um, uh, Robert. He's back. Is this uh, the same call? Sorry about that, guys. Is this the same caller, Robert? Hello. I can barely hear you. Hold on. Sorry about that. Turn my volume all the way up. Caleb? Yep, you're with me, Robert. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, uh, this is Willie. Willie, I'm sorry, Willie. Go ahead. Uh, well, okay, my question is, I have had people ask, or they basically say that the first portions of Genesis are not to be taken literally because uh, there's a slight difference in the, I think, the, the grammar. And I was wondering how, how is the best way to answer them? That's a good question. So we actually get this a lot too. Um, I have this. I have personal friends now who, um, uh, who uh, say the exact same thing. So what what would your response be uh, to this, Dad? Well, first of all, uh, what we should do in cases like this is we should ask ourselves: Are there other? Uh, uh, writers of scripture that interpret the first chapters of Genesis yes yeah, yeah the answer is yes and one of those of course they, is our own Savior Yeshua he speaks about the fact that Moses refers to the creation and when even uh, you know take Jonah for instance when Jonah's uh, they find out that Jonah is the cause for this uh, storm and that he's you know in this ship with all these others and they say what god do you worship and what does he say i worship the god who made the heavens and the earth and the dry ground where did he come to that knowledge mm -hmm. so 
the the fact that uh, Walton and some of the others have tried to make um, a uh, an interpretation of the first two chapters of Genesis on the basis of ancient Near Eastern um, uh, literature. Well, there's nothing wrong with looking at ancient Near Eastern literature and seeing how it may compare in terms of genre and in terms of language and style and so forth with the Bible. But the, the fact of the matter is that the first rule of hermeneutics, that is good hermeneutics, mm. is that the Bible interprets the Bible. And so do we have other times where we have poetic language? And it is true that the, uh, that the opening of Genesis, Genesis 1, is somewhat in poetic style. I wouldn't say it's straight poetry, but it's in some poetic style. Um, do we have other portions of scripture that are also in poetic style that are to be taken at, uh, you know, in its normal meaning? And the answer is yes. We have all of Isaiah, uh, a good part of Isaiah mm -hmm. is, in, uh, is in poetry. So uh, my, my point simply is this. To say, as John Walton does, that um, the uh, Dr. Walton who... Uh, I think he's still at Wheaton, but at any rate, um, to say that it has nothing whatsoever to do about physical creation is simply to allow a, uh, a, a certain hermeneutic to disregard the plain meaning of the text. The plain meaning of the text is that God is the creator and that nothing existed until he created it. We have a similar uh, opening, of, as you know, of the Gospel of John. He, he says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing existed, now I'm paraphrasing, but what the Word created it. Mm. So, you know, where did John come up with this? How did he know this? He realized, of course, that Yeshua the word, is the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, he says in verse 14. And then in verse 18, in the best of texts, it, I, the, the, uh, the later texts have son, the only begotten God, it mm. says, has made this known to us. So uh, John has Yeshua being the creator, one with the Father, one with the Spirit, and he does so on the basis of the first two chapters of Genesis. My big problem with those who are trying to tell us that the genre or the uh, style of the first two chapters of Genesis uh, makes it clear that they're not talking about creation as they have been so uh, long interpreted, is that they are allowing a, a uh, how can I say it, I won't say a guess, but they're, they're allowing a kind of saying, well, this looks like this, so they must be the same. Well, just because it's a different genre doesn't mean anything of that nature. And I would say to those who are asking the question, William, I would simply say, let's look throughout the rest of the scriptures. Are there other inspired texts, those who were born along by the Holy Spirit, according to Peter, who write that God created the heavens and the earth, and he spoke and it happened. Hmm. And of course, the Psalms tells us this, that he stretched out the heavens. It wasn't it, it, he, he, they're not interpreting the first two chapters of Genesis as though it's a description of God, the great king, building his palace, as some would have us say. Okay, so Willie, uh, for being the first caller to actually get a full question out to my father, you will receive uh, your own copy of his commentary on the Johannine Epistles 1, 2, and 3. Stay on the line, buddy. Uh, Marvelous! I'll, I'll have somebody get you uh, your address, and we'll send you out a free copy, okay? Thanks for your question. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's get back to the theme then and uh, talk about uh, the theme of the epistles. First of all, can we take all three of the epistles? Should we read them like Luke Acts? In other words, like, or should each one be taken individually? Uh, they, they, they certainly have a connection. The connection is progressive. You have, you have the, the first epistle, which is the, the longest, uh, the more full, but then it appears as though those to, who received the first epistle, that there were issues going on in their communities. When we read Second uh, John, we realized that there were those who were denying Yeshua mm. and were saying that he was not the Messiah. And that he deals with that, this spirit of anti-Messiah. He does so in the first epistle too, but he uh, very much so in, in the second. And in the third, you have false teachers. You have this diatrophies. 
who uh, you have Gaius who has been uh, a stalwart, but you have this Diotrephes who is trying to lead people astray. And so you, it's, it appears as though you have a progression. And, and uh, John is very clear, he's very straightforward, that they are not to even allow such a false teacher to remain in their community. And they're, they're not to even entertain them in their homes. They're not to, because there are those who are, and I'm now I'm kind of reading between the lines, but I'm quite sure that this elder John, he, he, he addresses himself or he uh, introduces himself as the elder. He's talking about being the final, the last living apostle. And he wants to make sure that the message, the apostolic message is clearly enunciated and not undermined. And so he's making very strong statements. And as I looked over, again, the history of what I've been part of for 30 plus years, uh, I see the same progression. Mm -hmm. I see that the, the, the Messianic movement, if we can use that term, uh, started out very much wanting to know the scriptures and wanted to get to the heart of the scriptures as they applied to Yeshua and as they applied to Israel as a whole and applied to the, the Jew and Gentile together. And then as it progressed, you began to see some who were becoming so enamored with uh, the false teaching found in much of the rabbinic literature that they began to leave their the, the, the communities and go elsewhere and began to deny that Yeshua was the Messiah. And then we have those who remain in the so-called Messianic movement who are false teachers. They're false prophets. They're prophesying that Yeshua is going to come back in 1999 or in 2000 or whatever, and and they and they uh, they are shown to be false prophets, and mm -hmm. they continue to teach false doctrines, and people are giving them all kinds of, of hearing and bringing them into their conferences and so forth. So I felt that uh, to take all three of the epistles was very valuable for us if we're willing to look at them and say, now how do these apply to us? Mm. Why? I, I just, excuse me for getting a little uh, <laughs> intense about this, but why? Why would believing communities call in unbelievers, known unbelievers, to teach them what is true? The scriptures, Paul says, mm -hmm. if you don't have the spirit of God, there is a veil that lies over your eyes. There's a veil that lies over your heart. And you don't see the Messiah in the scriptures the way you should. So uh, I just appeal to uh, the wider audience to say, you know, now, uh, let me just add this, that, that Paul equally uh, balances this with the, uh, the need to love, to love one another. In fact, you would have to say that one of the main themes of 1 John is, is to love one another, that, that we prove ourselves to be children of God when we love one another. But he's talking about loving those who have confessed Yeshua. Now, it doesn't mean we hate others. But it means that this is a love covenant relationship where we're willing to, to uh, serve one another. We're willing to help one another. We're willing to give to one another as needed. And so this is uh, what it means to be part of the body of the Messiah, to have Yeshua at the center, to affirm our uh, faith in him and in his work and to do all that we can to give him first place in everything. The chat room brings up a very good point. Where can you get the book? You can get the, the book uh, on TorahResource.com. Uh, look in the in the uh, homepage banners. One of them uh, will links directly to the pre-order. This book actually comes out. Uh, the official release date is on August 15th. Whether or not uh, people get their orders beforehand or not, is uh, uh, that'll be a, a, a fun little treat for people if they do. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, so let me go back to my questions. I'm, I'm trying to do, like, five things at once. I will say the one downside to doing a show at 2 o'clock in the afternoon as opposed to 9 o'clock in the morning is that my office is, like, 13 degrees hotter than it normally would be. And now with all the lights on, I'm melting. That's okay, though. Um, there is a link in the, uh, in the uh, chat room for those who would like to go directly to it. Um, if there's one thing that you think John is trying to get his audience to take away from each epistle or from all three together, what is it? It is to hold fast to what you have heard from the beginning. That's how he starts out. He starts first John by saying, what was from the beginning, what mm. we have heard. It's to go back and say, the apostles 
Well, let's start with Moses. With the Moses, the prophets, and the apostles have laid the foundation mm-hmm. and let us not ever depart from that. So in to use the later Reformed uh, view, he is really stressing sola scriptura and uh, that, that the Bible must be the foundation. And think about what Yeshua did on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 when they were questioning him and so forth and so on. And, the, and they were on the cusp of, of kind of wondering whether their faith was real or not because mm-hmm. He says, why are you so downcast? And they look at him, and again, I'm paraphrasing. They say, are you the only one that's come to Jerusalem and you don't know what's taking place here? And he said, what is it? And he said, well, that the, that Yeshua of Nazareth was crucified. And, and here it is the third day. In other words, we're leaving Passover, uh, the week of Passover, because it appears as though he, he hasn't followed through on what he said, that he would rise, uh, raise from the dead. And then he showed himself to them, and they realized who he was. Right. And what did it say? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained himself to them. So John is saying, don't give way to these other kinds of things, these other kinds of mystical, you know, hidden meanings. In fact, one of the papers I want to write, it's a burden on my heart, is going to be entitled, There is No Deeper Meaning in the Scriptures. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the meaning is what God gave us in the words as they are and as they would be properly interpreted within a grammatical historical interpretation. He says it's not up in heaven you have to go after it. It's not out into the sea you have to go get it. It's mm-hmm. near you. It's in your heart and in your mouth. In other words, it's the common. So we should read the Bible. So and we should in, and that's that. That's the that's the thrust. Can you expand on that for just a second? I mean, there, there are going to be people who say, "Whoa, whoa, wait!" Obviously, there's there's you know, uh, you can't just take the 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 meaning of of a text, right? I mean, isn't there more to what the Bible says? I mean, basically, what I'm getting at is the idea of application versus you know, multiple applications, one meaning. Okay, so I'm making a, st- a strict. Um, differentiation between the meaning of the text and the application. Now, a proper application is always in line with the meaning. But there's one meaning, even if there are many applications. Okay? The applications have to be directed by the Scriptures too, and led by the Spirit. But there's still one meaning. There's not multiple meanings. There's not... In fact, people don't realize this. The uh, gentleman who brought up the uh, question, which is a very good question, isn't it Rome that uh, canonized the Bible? Uh, no, the answer is no, it wasn't. It was a long time before Rome took over that uh, we began to see the canonization uh, of the Bible. But nonetheless, um, well, the canonization of the Torah, I should say, of the Tanakh was well in advance. It was already in place, so much so that uh, Yeshua could say, you know, in the scriptures it says, and everybody knows what he's talking about. So, but the the, the point simply is this, that there was this um, census plenier that was put forward by the church. Guess which church? What does census plenier mean? A deeper sense, a fuller sense. Okay? Who, who gave that to us? The Roman Catholic Church. And why? Because they had to find a deeper sense or a more full sense to give their, to give their theology a credence. Yeah, to give now power you have to the, the church, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, now you have the later rabbinics. I mean, when do you f- first find the so-called pardes? Late, you know, yeah. Late, very late. Yeah. Why do you have to have a pashat, a remes, you know, a sod, and 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 so forth and so on? Why do you have to have these, uh, darash? Well, it's because if you take the text in its meaning as it's given, you would never be able to come up with the all of the rabbit trails that the rabbis go on and pound the pulpit on, so to speak, saying this is what the Torah or the Tanakh says. Because you have to find a meaning that fits your theology. Right. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to take the meaning that is given to us. And the, the one illustration I like to use is if you go to a store, uh, we have, I don't know, if you have a, uh, a furniture store, okay, and you go and buy furniture, it's all in a box, and you take it home and you have to put it together. What do you presuppose? That when you read the instructions, they should be, you should follow them and you should be able to understand them without finding a deeper meaning. Oh, when it says put A together with B, what that really means is A is like this and B is like this and it means really to turn it upside down and to go backwards and so on and so on. No, 
language is language. If we give language its proper meaning in the context, in the culture in which it was written, then we understand what the author intended. Okay, hang on. We got another call. And this one we're going to want to take for sure because this is a student of yours who has actually been on this show before. And, oh, it rings, of course. Andre, I'm sorry. Andre is with us. Andre, how's it going, brother? How you doing, uh, hi, brother? Caleb. I can barely hear you. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what's going on. Hang on just a sec. Let's see if we can. Oh, there we go. No, okay. Okay, you got yeah, me now. I, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay, so. Um, um, hi, so, so my. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. My, well, my question for um, for Tim today has to do with uh, why he is a Baptist. Um, <laughs> and maybe to set up the question a little bit, recently on the Reformed Tour Observant Christians discussion on Facebook, uh, someone posted, um, someone who, who um, believes a, mo a more pedo baptistic perspective po posted something, um, posted quotes, for example, from a, a Reformed Baptist um, systematic theology, and he argues that um, he, what he says here is the Baptistic perspective, so the credo-Baptistic perspective, is premised upon the idea that the New Testament supersedes the Old. And so he says that believers in, in, uh, who follow Torah um, are inconsistent when they believe uh, that people should be baptized when they come to faith or come to an understanding of their faith rather than when they're infants. Um, if they're born okay. into faith. So, Actually, that's an yeah. excellent question, Andre. Um, and by the way, welcome home. And uh, so at any rate, uh, it's just the opposite. Why in the world did, uh, how did paedo-baptism begin? Paedo-baptism in the Presbyterian and, and uh, on other denominations began with supersessionism. Why? Right. Because they said, okay, we don't want to circumcise our sons because that's something that's of the old covenant. As far as their reading of Paul, by the way, Old Covenant, you know, it's only found one time in Second uh, Corinthians 3, so it's not a very often time used term. But at any rate, um, uh, we don't want to circumcise our uh, sons because Paul says circumcision is, is wrong. They misinterpreted Galatians 6. But at any rate, they took Galatians 6 as saying if a Gentile uh, receives circumcision, that uh, he would be accursed. So they don't want to circumcise, but they still want to follow through as having the covenant. So what do they do? They, they say, according to Colossians, baptism has replaced circumcision. And therefore, we're going to baptize our children, our sons, when they're eight days old. And if you look at the history of paedo-baptism, it was originally that they were to be baptized on the eighth day. At least uh, that's what I that's what I have discovered in my uh, uh, looking through the various documents. But uh, the, the simple answer is this: Where do you find any example in the apostolic scriptures, or in the Tanakh, anywhere in the Bible, where you have a, a child being baptized or immersed? as an infant. We find the mother having to take a mikvah. We don't find the, the child taking a mikvah at all. So I, I got to jump in here because this this conversation is is uh, there's there's I've heard this conversation actually debated from a Dutch reform uh, uh, perspective as well. This comes about because of a replacement. They, they, basically, the idea sa says that um, circumcision was the uh, uh, sacrament of the old covenant, and we have the same sacrament, but it's changed now to in the new covenant to baptism. And so, this is why the pedo or the 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 infant Baptists, uh, people who baptize infants, they're the ones who are saying, "Oh, well, it's replaced circumcision, and therefore we have to do it when they're infants." And the only reference that I think uh, the, the person who I was listening to who is Dutch Reform could come up with of some kind of a baptism of, of infants was going through the Red Sea and going down into the water and all families went, uh, uh, fathers, mothers, and, and children alike. And I thought that that was, uh, from, a, from a good scholar nonetheless, I thought that was a pretty far stretch to try to prove infant baptism. Well, the, the other thing is, is that if you study the history of in, in, uh, paedo-baptism, you discover that at least a good majority of the paedo-baptists believe that when that child is baptized as an infant, and they don't baptize him, they don't immerse him, they sprinkle some water on his head, at least most of them do, um, they believe he enters the covenant. He becomes a member of the covenant. But then 
he he has to confirm his covenant status at a point in time when he or she makes their own confession of faith. So they are, and then of course you have the question of what does it mean that they're members of the covenant? So what are they trying to do? They're trying to mimic exactly what the Mosaic covenant would be. They're trying to mimic it because um, if you have a, a, a Israelite family, if they have a child, does that child become a member of the covenant? Yes. And if he's a male, if he's circumcised on the eighth day, does he become a member of the covenant? Yes. Because it says in Genesis 17, a male who's not circumcised shall be cut off from his people, which means he is already part of the people. He's part of the covenant. And so they, they in their supersessionism or in their replacement theology, said, we're the new Israel. Therefore, we must have the signs of the covenant. What is the sign of the Mosaic covenant? It is circumcision, but it's also Sabbath. All right. So Sabbath and circumcision have to be replaced. Sabbath becomes Sunday, circumcision becomes baptism, and they do this on the um, analogy of Colossians 2, when it says that you have been circumcised with the circumcision of Messiah. Okay, so they're saying, okay, that's a non-physical circumcision then. But if you read it in context, it seems to me what he's saying is that a Gentile believer is not to be uh, kept at arm's length or disallowed from associating with the community of believers until he's circumcised. This was the issue that came up in Acts 15. No, that, but give him time to learn and to understand. He is to be received as circumcised with the circumcision of the Messiah, but then he will learn the Torah because Moses has preached every Shabbat, and he will learn that, that there are commandments that he must certainly obey and wants to obey. Okay, Andre, you're still on with us. Uh, does that answer your question? You got you got another one for for Tim? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it does. Um, and I I totally agree with that understanding of uh, Colossians two, um, what is it, verse twelve or something like that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just thought it was interesting that this man comes from a, uh, I mean, a Torah observant perspective. So, yeah, um, it's not an issue that's very much discussed in the uh, Messianic or Torah movement. You're right. Yeah, all right, thanks. So, Andre, you're actually our last caller for the day, so I will give you a book as well. Um, but I know where to find oh, you, so I'm not going to put you back on hold. Um, so we'll get you a book as okay. well. Thank you for your call. Okay, and for everyone else who would like to uh, have a chance to uh, get a free copy of my father's book, a commentary on the Johannine Epistles, I would encourage you to do one of three th things. We will be giving away three more copies. One on our Twitter account in the next week. One on our Facebook account in the next week, the Torah Resource uh, account that is for both Twitter and Facebook. And then one on our Instagram um, account, which uh, you should follow if you haven't. Um, so we will give a copy away on each one of our social media outlets. And uh, so keep your eyes open for ways to do that. I'm not sure if we're going to do that before or after my father and I get back from Ontario. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, inter interesting look at, at first, second, and third John. Is there anything else about, I mean, you have, it, it took you, what, 52 weeks to, to, uh, to write this book, but you only did it once a week, right? Yes, I, I worked on it throughout, you know, but we taught it on it once a week, correct? So, um, 432 pages, and then there's how many um, how many audio le lectures? 52, right? 52 lectures. Right. So, if you order it, uh, you, you can you can pre-order the hard copy now. You can download uh, the direct download uh, right away of both the book and the audio. And uh, Drew asked, can we just buy a copy? Yes, you can buy a copy. Go to TorahResource.com, look in the... Uh, in the um, well, the toolbar or the, the, I'm sorry, the, the advertisement should be right on the homepage. Uh, you can scroll through those and find it there and it links directly to it. Um, I want to thank my father for coming on and for the callers who called in. It's been fun. And, uh, I hope that everyone will, uh, do us a favor and pray for us as we are traveling to Lucan, Ontario. And, uh, as we're speaking on, well, um, multiple different things, my dad will be teaching on the Holy Spirit. I'll be teaching on, um, well, the doctrines of grace is my main focus. And then also, a teaching titled, Have We Left the Church? And uh, my teachings, the, the lectures that I will be giving, will be up hopefully uh, as soon as we get back from Lucan, Ontario, in our Messiah Matters More page for our supporters. So we thank our supporters once again for being a part of this show and helping produce it. Um, thank you once again, my father. I hope that everyone enjoyed this and that uh, you got something out of it. And I hope that uh, this, com uh, this conversation, and not only the conversation, but this wonderful new book will do one thing. And that one thing 
is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. Why? I'll tell you why. Because Messiah matters.